Okay, now in this lecture we're going to be talking about the founding of the English mainland colonies. And for that we're going to have to go back to 1585 to about 1732. That's when we get kind of the starting out of the first 13 colonies up here in uh, North America. England and colonization. Now guys, between, 15, uh, between 1603 and 1688, it was crazy times in England. Y'all ready to go to the next slide? I mean, basically you had religious, uh, intense religious conflict, you know, between the Catholics and the Protestants, and not only that, but the Protestants and the Puritans. You had economic upheavals and dislocations, civil war, and the removal of two kings from the throne. Now when the Stuart kings come in after Elizabeth, they were Scottish, well, the Stuarts were a Scottish royal family, and they came down and the Stuart kings uh, believed in, abs they wanted to be absolute monarchs and rule the people fiercely. And they wanted to have like a commanding voice in finance, religious reform, and foreign policy. Indeed, they were so kind of crazy in their anti-Catholic rule that uh, a guy by the name of Guy Fox rose up. Now, before I get to this, I'll ask you a question. Do they have a July 4th in England? Yeah, July 4th, July 5th, July 6th. Ah, but that's kind of a joke. Do they have an Independence Day? Yeah, their version of Independence Day is they celebrate Guy Fawkes Day. And Guy Fawkes was basically a Catholic that was incredibly worried about rulings that were soon going to come before Parliament. So what he and a band of cohorts did was they planted, like, they filled the basement of Westminster Abbey where Parliament met with explosives. And they were going to set it off and you know, kill all the parliament and then basically elect, elect more parliamentarians that would be friendlier to their cause. This didn't work, however. Why? Because um, one of the uh, conspirators, his uncle worked as a parliamentarian and, you know, he didn't want to see his uncle die. So he writes him a letter, even though he didn't sign his name and he puts it under his door that said, hey, don't show up for work today. And on that day, the guy went to his office, opened up, saw the letter, said, wait a minute, why don't they want me to go to work today? And all, they started searching throughout all of uh, Parliament, and they discovered the explosives. And of course, then all the guys were rounded up. They were all beheaded. And to this day in England, they still, still celebrate Guy Fawkes Day, where they hang up an effigy of Guy Fawkes, and basically they take a collection to buy firewood to build a huge bon bonfire and um, set it afire. That's every November 5th. And the James Kings were James the... I mean, the Stuart Kings were James the I, Charles the I, James the first gave us the uh, King James version of the Bible, not basically because he wanted you know to get God's word out. Well, he did, but what was more important to him was he wanted to have a standardized way to spell English words, because there were so many different dialects and stuff like that in England that you had tons of different spelling of the same word. So he put it in the Bible. This is how we spell those words. 
And of course, because they want to be absolute monarchs, they don't get together well with Parliament at all as they try to take away more and more of their power. Ready to go to the next slide? <laughs> and so, when Charles I, uh, basically he tells them that he wants more money, Parliament says we're not going to do it, he dissolves Parliament, and Parliament said forget this, they uh, start a civil war against the king. Because they were the ones that knew how to get all the money and all the tax codes and everything like that. The king didn't. And the uh, Stuart Loyalists basically were fighting against political and religious uh, dissenters that represented the House of Commons. And underneath their leader, Oliver Cromwell, they won the Civil War. And for almost a dozen years, the nation lived as a commonwealth. But they realized, you know what? Ruling ourselves isn't so great. So in 1660, they invited the Stuart kings to come back and retake the throne, ushering in what was known as the Restoration Era. And of course, now you have Charles II, who was the son of Charles I, the king they revolted in, coming in to rule over them, followed by James II. Again, both these guys are total absolute monarchs, and Parliament really resents the control that they're trying to exert over them and the uh, usurping of their power. So a representative of parliament goes to the Netherlands and he goes to one of the lesser sons of nobility, uh, William, and he says, hey William, how would you like to come back and be king of England, you and your wife? You can be king and queen. Now before you think that's a great deal, think about it. He's being, there's already a king on the throne in England and basically these people revolted against one king. They couldn't even rule themselves and they invited that royalty back. But on the flip side, if he stayed uh, where he was, he probably never would be king. He says, I tell you what, I'll do it but I won't use my army against them. And so they say, okay. So William comes and basically Parliament had stopped paying uh, the king. He didn't get money, so he was having less and less troops. When he sees how many troops William has, he abdicates the throne. And it ushers in what's known as the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And you have William and Mary take power and rule over the country. So as you can see, we had a, a long period of chaotic times. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, because you had this chaos, uh, wealthy men financed risky colonizing ventures where they took like members of religious sects, S-E-C-T-S, and uh, other impoverished people who would go and settle in America. And you had a lot of impoverished people that said, hey, it's, I can either die here or I might be able to have a chance in the new world. I think I'll choose the new world. Basically, they would form 
joint stock companies that planted these English colonies in the New World. Because remember, the ones that uh, Queen Elizabeth tried, kind of as part of her uh, anti-Spanish foreign policy, they cost her a lot of money and produced absolutely nothing. So you have these entrepreneurs that were starting these companies, and later on, the king uh, might give a... Um, large tracts of land to individuals to establish proprietary colonies. Ready to go to the next slide? Colonial placement. Now, basically, what we're going to divide this in is these English colonists thought of themselves as resident of four distinct regions. And we're going to kind of talk about them as they were settled. You have the Chesapeake, which is right about there. You have New England, which is right up there. You have the Middle Colonies, which is right there. And then you have the Lower South. Carolinas and Georgia. Those were the last settled. Now remember, each of these guys thinks of themselves as totally different from everybody else. Indeed, if you're in the Chesapeake, if you're in Virginia, you might hate your neighbor who's Maryland, who's in the same region, and you don't even care about what's going on in South Carolina, New York, Massachusetts. Because we're at the very beginning stage. And we're going to talk about each of these groups uh, separately. You ready? Okay, settling of the Chesapeake. All right. The planting of Jamestown. Now, guys, the Virginia Company was chartered in London in 1606, and it named itself uh, in honor of the king, King James. Now, wait a minute. How do you get King James, how do you get Virginia from King James? Well, King James wasn't married. So, he was a virgin. He was the virgin king. So they named themselves Virginia. They actually were able to get a group of colonials to go over. They land in Maine. And were even able to build a small ship from the woods there. But, just like the colony that was attempted up in Newfoundland under Elizabeth, uh, winter came and it drove the colonials back to England. Well, if you got money, you want to make money, so they send out a second expedition in 1608 and they founded Jamestown. Once again, naming the town after King James. Now, guys, if you wanted to know, a, you couldn't have, you would have had to have worked really hard to have found a worse place to have started a colony. Basically, it was built in the middle of the swamp. It was surrounded by a 13,000 strong Indian confederacy led by Chief Powhatan. Rocks they found that at first they thought were precious pretty much turned out to be iron pyrite or fool's gold. Fire destroyed a lot of their public buildings and houses, 
including the first building they built, which was a jail. You had hunger, disease, exposure, and sickness kill more than half the colonists. And guys, they had this whole thing that was, they had a communal uh, storage area, storage area, where all the fish you caught, you were supposed to take to this community storage, and everybody in the community could take food out of that. Well, if you're a fisherman, you're working your butt off, you bring back all this fish, you're going to have guys that aren't working at all, which you did have some, that just go and they'll pick up and take some fish and take them home. Well, that means that you're going to stop putting all your fish in there, and you're going to stop putting all the deer or turkeys or uh, whatever else you may have caught into the community warehouse because you... you you're not going to feed other people's laziness. So you have all these people die. And Captain John Smith basically comes up and he says, guys, that's it. We're going to military rule. If you don't work, you don't eat. And in 1609, the uh, colony changed from a joint stock venture and moved to agriculture. But guys, th this is done in the middle of the fall, which is not when you plant seeds. So throughout the winter, they endured what's known as the starving time. Where seven out of eight of the colonials die during that period. Because it's crushing. Well, the remaining colonists go, you know what, it was a nice try, but uh, let's go ahead and let's reload the ships and let's head back to England. They loaded up the boats, sailed off. That afternoon, however, they ran into a supply ship that the company had sent to help the colony that basically had new supplies, new settlers, um, everything like that. So they decide to turn the ship around and return to Jamestown. Y'all ready for the next slide? So what is the colony going to do for wealth? Well, basically tobacco turned out to be the colony's salvation. John Rolfe, who was a smoker, brought the idea of raising tobacco. He got tobacco from the Indians, learned how to cure it, and it was extremely popular. I mean, King James I hated it. He tried to pass laws against it, called it dangerous, sinful, and enfeebling. But people still bought it like mad. Indeed, in 1615, uh, 2,000 pounds of tobacco were sent back to England. Oh, that music's too loud. Didn't sound that loud. What? No. Crazy, crazy, crazy. There we go. In 1615, 2,000 pounds were sent back to England. By 1617, they're doing five times as much, 20,000 pounds. By 1620, there's uh, 40,000 pounds. They've doubled it. By 1622, there's more than uh, 60,000 pounds. By 1626, just four years later, half a million pounds of tobacco go back to England. And just three years after that, we have 1.5 million pounds of tobacco. 
Has uh, Jamestown found a success? You bet they have. Only deal is, if you're going to be doing tobacco, because basically the tobacco plants sap the nutrients out of the soil, you're going to need new lands. Also, it's very labor intensive, so you're going to need lots of people to come out there. Y'all ready to go to the next slide? Okay, new demands and consequences. Basically, uh, to get the labor that you needed, they took the head right system from the Dutch which basically was if you could pay for your passage over here you'd get 50 acres of land and as most of the incredibly poor people couldn't afford that they would sell seven years of their labor to in a contract to the ship's captain the captain would come over here then he'd sell off that contract meaning where you had to work for somebody for uh, seven years but after you worked those seven years, you were given free, 50 free acres of land, which is something you never could have had in Europe. And so many people start coming to the colony that by uh, 1618, the House of Burgesses was formed, basically to give the planners an active decision-making rule in the colonial government So we're already starting to have self-rule. But because more and more people are coming over here trying to get more and more land, y'all remember Native Americans lived on that land. They weren't really uh, excited about their lands being taken away, you have a lot more Native American attacks. And they say, King, King, you gotta help us, you gotta help us. So the king says, okay, and basically he dissolves the company's charter and made Virginia a royal colony where he would take care of them. Now, of course, this also meant that he got a larger share of the tobacco crop, the profits from the tobacco crop. Ready to go to the next slide? A telling tale of two tonnages. In 1619, a Dutch captain arrived off of Jamestown. He had a cargo that was really difficult to sell. Meanwhile, uh, that later that same month, a second ship arrives in um, Jamestown, and its cargo goes to the highest bidder. One of the ships, its cargo was slaves. The sec the uh, second cargo was women. So, which was the one that you think went to the highest bidder? It was the cargo of women. Because the guys, basically, these were slaves that he wasn't able to sell on the Sugar Islands. The colonials up in Jamestown had no idea what he was talking about. So basically, they were bought as indentured servants. They would work for seven years, then they got their land for free. But the Chesapeake was very heavily populated by men rather than women because you need men to do all the uh, farm labor and hacking out the woods and building the roads. So more men came over here than women, but once you got your society set up, a lot of people wanted to have a wife. Making them very valuable. Ready to go to the next slide? Maryland, a Catholic
Catholic refuge. <clears throat> okay, basically with Maryland, you have to know about George Calvert. He was a Catholic who was in England's government. And you know he had to have been very talented if a Catholic has a high position in uh, King James's uh, court because of his Catholicism. So basically what George Calvert wanted, he wanted a, a colony of large landowners and tenant farmers. In 1632, he petitioned King Charles I for 10 million acres of land next to Virginia. The king gave him lots of personal power, allowing him to give the land. But he couldn't uh, give the land away just to Catholics. It had to be open to everybody. Ready to go to the next slide? So in 1634, two ships, the Ark and the Dove, set sail, carrying 200 Catholic and Protestant settlers. And most of the settlers were Protestant. Simply because they had more accessibility to the funds to make the voyage possible. And of course, as soon as they get over here, as you can guess, uh, quickly it began to resemble Virginia. They too start a head right system to get more people over here because they're also growing tobacco. And instead of viewing them as friends, Virginia views them as competition. Ready to go to the next slide? Colonists at War in Maryland. Okay, in Maryland, the uh, religious strife that's going on in England is really affecting Maryland because, once again, they had a lot of Catholics that lived there. So the religious strife in the 1640s was difficult. Calvert tried to get ahead of that by writing a Toleration Act. It was kind of uh, one of those, hey, you know, uh, in an act concerning religion, it was kind of like, look, be cool to each other. Come on. If you're a Protestant or a Catholic. But that wasn't enough to appease Cromwell, who basically revokes the company's charter, turned it into a royal colony, which lasted until the Glorious Revolution when John Code led the Protestants in rebellion against Maryland's proprietor and obtained a royal charter for the company. Y'all ready to go to the next slide? Troubles in the Chesapeake. Well, guys, basically you had two different worlds in the Chesapeake. You had conflict between the wealthy planners and all the newcomers. 
and between the eastern inhabitants and the residents of the back country and uh, kind of split Virginia. I mean, the wealthy guys got all the good land. If you did get that 50 acres after you worked for seven years, usually it was land that was uh, out in the backwoods that was seen as an invasion line by Native Americans. All you could really do was susten, uh, just grow crops, like sustenance level, because we really didn't have the transportation to uh, get those goods to market. And of course, you were also seen as the invasion line by Native Americans. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, then war breaks out between uh, England and the Dutch. And we'll get more into that a little later. But this war put more than 6,000 indentured servants and 2,000 slaves out of work. The government began to pass taxes to build forts. Now, of course, these forts that they said, hey, we're going to protect everybody out on the frontier. In reality, they uh, protected Governor Berkeley and his, the lands of his friends. Not really the civilians living out in the back country. Ready to go to the next slide? Bacon's Rebellion. And it's into this that a young guy from England comes over here. He's already a rich man. He's 27 years old. And basically he wanted to start a fur trading business. Now in order to, to, to uh, become a fur trader, you had to get a license from Governor Berkeley. And Governor Berkeley says, no, I don't know you, because uh, basically if you had a fur trading license, you were supposed to give him a little bit of your money each year. And Berkeley didn't know him. So Berkeley says, I'm not going to do it. And uh, Bacon's unable to get into the uh, governor's inner circle. Meanwhile, out in the West, you have a lot of Native Americans carrying out raids against those on the frontier. And Governor Berkeley totally refuses to assist them. So Bacon goes out. Uh, he uh, rises up a bunch of uh, villagers of colonials and he says let's go get these natives yeah and they lead a march out and they uh, destroy an Indian village sad thing was was that this tribe had lived peacefully with the nearby English oh but also if you're one of those conspiracy people uh, this Native American village just happened to be on rich, uh, on animals that had a lot of fur that would have been worth a lot of money. So maybe he was trying to stake out his own little piece of the pie. But when they're able to successfully do that, Bacon then realizes, man, I've got a lot of power. I've got a lot of angry uh, people with me. So he says, let's go get Jamestown and everybody goes yeah and they begin the march to Jamestown y'all ready for the next slide well the results of the rebellion. So 
So what does the government do? The government kind of freaks out because they know that this army is marching out towards them. So they go and they restore the vote to propertyless men. They forbid excessive fees that the sheriff can put against them. They limit the sheriff's tenure. All in an attempt to try to make some of the people that are so angry at them go back. It doesn't work. So basically this rebel army is moving towards them, taking over and burning down plantations along the way. Now they would take the wives and daughters of these plantation owners, put them in white their white aprons, and they put those white aprons at the very front of their army. Now, why did they put all these wives and daughters in the front of the army? Well, because guys, if Berkeley and his men were going to fire at Bacon's men, basically they'd have to kill their wives and daughters to do it. So they're getting closer and closer to Jamestown. Governor Berkeley freaks out. He flees to Maryland calling for um, the backup of more British troops. The rebels under Bacon totally burned down Jamestown. And in the celebration and everything like that, Bacon uh, con contracts dysentery, which he dies of. And almost as soon as Bacon dies of dysentery, all the rebels realize, um, you know what, we're nothing more than farmers and a uh, British army is coming to put us down. So they kind of skedaddle. They head out and the whole rebellion is doomed. And Berkeley, of course, returns. Because he felt brave enough to return. Now, just as um, a, some people point to this as where race was made something to divide Americans, because I told you that there were, what, 6,000 indentured servants, 2,000 slaves put out of work. Well, guys, they acted together. And if there was any way that those in power could divide people, <coughs> it would be better for them. So it was after this that they started segregating. Because united we stand and divided we fall. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay, colonial Chesapeake life. Okay, all right. I want you to do this at home or wherever you're watching this lecture. Because uh, if you want to know the one thing that describes everything in the Chesapeake, it's tobacco. So I say Chesapeake and you say tobacco. Chesapeake. Chesapeake. Now, because you have everybody growing tobacco, because that's where the money was coming in, there's not really the creation of communal institutions. Like, there's not a lot of big cities, and there's not... Because the money's in the land, and you usually don't need merchants located on land to do your trading of tobacco for you. There were so many rivers within Virginia... That basically either you had access to a river or somebody you knew had access to a river where you just take your crop over there and deal directly with the English merchant. And until the 1680s, it's mainly populated by indentured male servants. Because remember, times were so crazy in England. 
But after the 1680s, England improved economy caused a greater reliance on slave labor. Now what happened in the 1680s? Ah yeah, the glorious revolution and William and Mary coming into power who were not absolute monarchs, who gave power back to Parliament, who allowed people to choose what religion they wanted to be, who held on to power by letting go of power. And because that, because things are more stable in England now, well, a lot of people aren't willing to risk their life to come over here to the New World when they might be able to make some good money in England. Ready for the next slide? New England, colonies of dissenters. New England, colonies of dissenters. Starting with the Plymouth Colony. Now in Welcome in England, the Pilgrims and other separatists boarded the Mayflower to head to the New World. Now, they had tried this once before, Puritans had. The first group of Puritan refugees, 180 attempted to land in Virginia. They said, yeah, we're going to go to the New World. But by the time they get here, there were only 50 that were surviving. And of course, once they get to uh, Virginia, uh, like I said, it's part of the Chesapeake, everything's about tobacco. So their faith kind of wanes. This is the group from Leiden that uh, traveled to a Dutch city. And when they get to the Dutch city, nobody's persecuting them. They really kind of enjoy it. But then they start to worry because they see their kids picking up like they're starting to speak Dutch. They're starting to hang out with Dutch friends. Maybe their son likes a Dutch girl. Maybe the, um, their daughter likes a Dutch boy. And I was, no, that's not what we're about. Because these guys are the Puritans that believed they were here to purify the English church. And they're so desperate to get out of there because they, they want to create a shining example that will become the envy of everybody's eye. So they sell themselves into servitude for passage over to the New World. And they too were supposed to go to Virginia. But instead, the captain who made this trip numerous times, um, he gets in a storm and he gets lost in the voyage so instead of landing off the coast of Virginia, he lands hundreds of miles further, dis further north off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Everybody caught that? Ready to go to the next slide? Plymouth Colony continued. So basically they uh, decide that they're going to sign the Mayflower Compact up there off Cape Cod, Massachusetts. 
And in that Mayflower Compact, it gave political rights to any man who was willing to stay and abide by the law. They got crucial assistance from Squanto and his tribe, and Squanto is a really interesting tale. He knew how to speak English. How did he know how to speak English? Well, there had been English fishermen that had been off Massachusetts fishing. Uh, he was captured there when the men, some of the crew of the ship went on um, shore to get supplies. He was captured, taken back to London to be sold as a slave. A church bought him uh, and brought him because they wanted to return him to England. Uh, basically, he converted to Christianity there. Uh, he learned English. And then when they finally had the resources, they were able to send him back and he was dropped off at exactly the same spot he was picked up as. And so that's curious. They gave crucial assistance to the initial settlers. And the initial growth of the colony was slow, but it was very steady. All the land up in New England was purchased from the Native American tribes. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, Massachusetts Bay and its settlers. Well, you have this group of Puritans that are settling where the king did not give them permission to settle. How are they going to solve this? Well, one of the big leaders of the Puritan church was John Winthrop back in London. He was able to work for the king and he did get a charter for a Puritan colony which gave a lot of control to the Puritan church. I'm sure the king was like, we'll be glad to see you guys go. And in the 1630s, he goes around to Puritan uh, churches and you have this great migration to the New World, to the ones that were going up to the New England area. He was telling them like they, it was their duty as Puritans to build Jerusalem on a hill, a new Zion in the wilderness. And so you had three different waves because a lot of these Puritans were under religious tensions and economic strife, so they were more than willing to get out of there. They went to places like New England, like Virginia, like the West Indies or the Sugar Isles. And the majority of most of them actually went to the Sugar Isles. The second largest wave actually went to the Chesapeake. Because I guess that's where the money was, but you did have a lot that did go to New England. Ready for the next slide? Now the development of the colony. Basically guys, up in Massachusetts, the Puritans had small farming villages and seaport towns. Why? Well, because guys, the scratchy soil up there really isn't that good for crops. So it can't really sustain a huge population. So these kind of small villages and seaport towns are ideal. And they're also ideal for the ministers, the Puritan ministers, to reinforce their beliefs and what they see about the family hierarchy. Because according to Puritans, only men could hear from God. So spiritually, the father was the head of the household, then came firstborn son, secondborn, etc., so on. After you got through all the men, then you could go to the women. Mom, sisters. Because once again, they believed that men could hear from God and women couldn't. Or it wasn't okay for men could preach to women, but women 
couldn't preach or uh, tell thoughts of God to men. Ready to go to the next slide? Government in Puritan, Massachusetts. Now guys, this uh, government was designed on the Puritans' views of God's law. How they believed God saw things. So of course there was no social equality. You had guys that were better than others. For example, if you were a rich guy, well, your wealth showed you how much God loved you. If you were a really good carpenter, everybody thought your works were a piece of art. Well, every single piece of those works of art showed God's grace and beauty. So you were better than other carpenters. Men are better than women, etc. so on. Political participation was limited to saints only or members of the Puritan church. Personal behavior was strictly regulated, which as I told you, as most of these are small towns, it's really easy for others to regulate personal behavior. And anybody who ever grew up in a small town or has to visit a small town knows that everybody knows everybody else's business. And religious dissent was not tolerated. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, what happened to those that were dissidents? Well, uh, Quakers, at first they were banished, and then if they continued to challenge the system, they were eventually hung. Roger Williams was a preacher who had graduated from Cambridge in Boston. At first everybody was real excited about having him as the pastor, but he starts the antinomian crisis because he preached that he thought that the church and state should be separated. In other words, if you were the pastor, you shouldn't serve as a judge or a mayor. And he was banished, cast out of uh, Massachusetts. So he says, okay, he goes uh, and buys a whole lot of land from the Native Americans, starting Providence Plantation. A lot of other uh, dissidents that are cast out of um, Massachusetts go there. And by 1644, he has a charter from the king and he starts his colony, Rhode Island. Ready for the next slide? Then you have Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson was a woman that uh, she started having a Bible study, meetings at her house. Now, who did I tell you that Puritan women could preach to? They couldn't preach to men, but they could preach to other women. Well, the only problem with it, a lot of women started attending these meetings. And, because there were a lot of women there, uh, and as this was a seaport town up in Boston, a lot of sailors would like to go by and enjoy the company of women. Well, she started preaching that she believed that God's grace was more important to our salvation than a salvation by works. For in other words, the Puritans believed, you know, the Puritan work ethic, that you worked hard, 
because the end product and result would show God's glory and would also show that you were saved? She said, no, it says there in the Bible that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. It's his grace that saves us, not by what we can do. Well, she gets, uh, her group gets so large that they're even able to throw Winthrop, who was the uh, governor, out of power. Really quick, they rush in, they put him back into power. And um, they put her on trial. And at the trial, uh, you read the debates and or you read the uh, court records and it's like they ask her a question. Bam, she gives back an answer uh, with a chapter and verse. Ask her another question. Bam, she gives another answer, chapter and verse. And so on and so on it goes. And so finally they ask her a question. And uh, at the end is, how do you know that? And she made a fatal flaw. She said, God told me. <gasps> well, in the Puritans, of course, God doesn't speak to women. Oh, that's it. So basically they throw her out. And to make sure that uh, other heretics don't rise up, they start Harvard College as a college to uh, teach. Uh, the orthodoxy to uh, people who are going to become Puritan uh, pastors and that's why Harvard College today is one of the strongest Christian universities ha! just kidding the Puritans get thrown out of it but that happens later alright y'all ready to go to the next slide? Now, not everybody was kicked out. You did have people that voluntarily left because they wanted to start their own Puritan colony. Like Thomas Hooker, he takes some uh, Puritans north. They found Connecticut. Others might go up as far as Maine or out to New Hampshire. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, Indian suppression. You did have a war with the Pequot Indians back in 1636. The Pequot was a tribe that had actually lived peacefully with the Puritans. And they had even been allies of the English. But the Pequod had the misfortune of um, living at the mouth of the uh, Mississippi River. And basically the English joined together with the Narcissus and Mohegan Indians. Mohegan, M-O-H-E-G-A-N. And wipe out the village. So the whole war ended with the destruction of the Pequot. And things like I said were pretty cool. The Puritans were paying Native Americans for their land and expanding slowly until... Ready for the next slide? King Philip's War in 1675. Basically, King Philip was, uh, his real name was uh, Medicum, but the English called him uh, King Philip. He was the chief. His dad had sold a lot of the tribal lands to the uh, Puritans. And he gets up and he looks around and he notices that the Puritans outnumber his people by two to one. And he wants to get his land back from the Indians. So he calls kind of like this council to let off steam and to talk about, you know, hey, we need to get this land back. And his secretary was named John Sassaman. 
That was his English name that they gave him. Well, John Sassman is listening to Medicum say this, and he says, I bet you the English would like to know what King Philip is doing. So John Sassaman leaves. He goes to the English, and he tells them that Medicum uh, wants his land back. And um, then he returns. And then, three days later, his body was discovered. He was murdered by an icy river. Now, who are you going to say killed him? If you're the Native Americans, you're going to believe the English killed him. If you're the English, you're going to believe the Native Americans killed him. And so, basically, what the English do is they go ahead and they uh, arrest two Native Americans and they kill them. Well, guys, this gives Medicum exactly what he wants. Now he has something that his people can rally around and they start to attack the Puritan settlers. And as you can guess, he has a lot of early victories. But as when you're on the warpath, you don't get time to take dinner when you want to have dinner or sleep when you want to sleep. And it is winter, so it should come as no surprise that sickness starts spreading through his troops. He starts to run low on gunpowder. The English, meanwhile, get together with their Mohawk allies. And they uh, block the western escape of Medicum's men. They then set fire to an Indian village. And Medicum's still on the run until one night when Medicum is sleeping, a former ally of his kills Medicum and delivers his head to the English. And pretty much when the Native Americans lose, when that war is over, the final victory by the uh, Puritans pretty much ends Native American resistance in New England. You ready? Change and reaction in New England. Now guys, by about the 1660s, there was a declining religious fervor uh, amongst the Puritans. Why? Well, because some of them got a taste of success and they had other responsibilities. Like, let's say you guys, when you graduate from college, you get a job offer that you're going to get be paid $80,000 a year to manage this one store. And you're like, oh, wow. And you know, you, you love going to church. You love tithing. You'd be there every Wednesday, every uh, Sunday. But now with this new position, they tell you, uh, you are, however, not going to be able to work one Sunday each month or go to church on Wednesdays anymore. Well, you kind of justify that by saying, oh, well, I'm going to be able to give more money to the church, so it'll be okay. Well, you do so great in that job that within a year, you're offered an even larger district, which means you're now over like 15 stores. You have, you're the uh, um, supervisor of them. You're getting paid $100,000. But now, you can only go to church twice a month. You have to be working two Sundays. Well, you justify that by saying, oh, that's okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tithing more money. Well, you continue to do great. And within four years, you're offered a position with corporate. Which means now, you have a heck of a lot more responsibilities. You've only got one Sunday off. 
you're making a lot more money, but in that one Sunday off, you want to spend it with your wife and your kid and have a rest because your job is so stressful. Well, guys, that's exactly what happened to the Puritans. You have people not at going to church anymore. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is, is that if you have less people going to church, then you have less people that can take part in elections. Which means that if somebody can control um, how the peop members that are there are going to vote, it's going to be really tough for an opponent to get his way in. So what the church does is they start what's known as the halfway covenant. The halfway covenant says that, okay, if your mom and dad used to go to church but they don't go anymore, you can still come back and come to church even though your parents might be kicked out of the church. So basically it was giving the opportunity for the kids of the former church members to come back to church so that basically there would be more people who would be able to vote. Ready to go to the next slide? Now there were attempts by the crown to end the domination of this area by the Puritan church. For example, uh, Charles II revoked the colony's charter. James II established the Dominion of New England and put Sir Edmund Andros in as governor. And when news of the Glorious Revolution reached the colony, Massachusetts overthrew Andros. And Massachusetts became a royal colony. Ready for the next slide? But in becoming a new a royal colony, basically William and Mary and the royal charter ended all of Puritan political, religious, and social control. So the whole reason why this colony was founded is now totally irrelevant because the king has come in and taken over and the church has lost all of its power. Now, it should come no, as no surprise that when people are freaking out because all of a sudden the church lost all that political power, that you have the Salem witchcraft trials take place. Where you have all those people hung on the words of girls who said that um, devil spoke to them. The Crucible is a really good movie about that if you haven't seen it. Stars Winona Ryder, I think. Y'all ready to go to the next slide? The pluralism of the middle colonies. Now guys, we talked about the Chesapeake and that's not kind of like what we really like to think America being born out of. We talked about New England and all the Puritans and well, some people don't like to think that's what America kind of got its stuff from. Guys, a lot of what America got, um, what we consider um, American is from the middle colonies. Now, to get into the middle colonies, these are the places like New York, New Jersey, 
you got to know about conditions in England. In England, things were pretty bad. Uh, the restoration of Charles II, the king, but he liked to spend more money than he had. So he paid off some of the money by giving proprietary colonies in the New World. Also, he blamed his one-time ally, the Dutch, for most of his woes. So, uh, you know, saying, hey, it's not my fault that we're going broke and that I'm spending more money than I have. It's uh, the Dutch. They're the reason why we're not making the money that we should be. So you have uh, war and the passage of new acts that are England's answer to, the, to try to curtail the power of the Dutch. Like they passed the Navigation Act of 1660, saying that a ship must be constructed in either America or England if it wanted to do trade with England. The crew had to be at least 75% English or colonial, because remember the colonials were English. And certain crops like tobacco, sugar, cotton, indigo, dye woods, and ginger could only be transported to England or to an English port. This was followed by the Staple Act of 1663 that said nothing could be imported through America unless it had been through England first. Now, of course, the reaction to this law totally varies. Virginia hates it. Why? Because now, because there's no longer competition or a lot of different uh, colony or different powers selling uh, or a lot of different merchants selling goods to the uh, Virginians. They can only get it through England. Uh, that means the price is going to be higher. And also because England is the only place that is getting all that tobacco you're growing, the money you're making out of it is going to be lower because the demand is going to be less because everybody has to dump their tobacco there. <coughs> and because there is so much money in tobacco, you know that the king is making sure that this is being adhered to. So Virginia hates it. Meanwhile, the northern colonies, eh, they don't care. They kind of ignore it. Now, how can they be able to ignore it? Because, guys, they don't have any cash crops up there. They don't have any limitation on their uh, produce. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, the English-Dutch War. Uh, in 1664, King Charles II sent his fleet. Oh. Okay. Before I get to that, let me tell you. The war, it ends in a stalemate. I mean, England did gain some advantageous uh, places. Like they got more of an expanse in America, which meant less competition, as well as a foothold in Africa that would emerge into an English expansion and control the slave trade. Now, how did they take over the New Netherlands? Well, basically in 1664, the king uh, sends, King Charles II sent a fleet to capture it, and the governor of the city is standing there by Wall Street, which was the street next to the city walls, 
waving a white flag, saying, hey, we're not even going to fight you for it. So basically, they get the land totally free. They change the name from New Amsterdam to New York. Because New Amsterdam was the capital of the New Netherlands. And the king then turns around and gives the land to the Duke of York to pay off his debts. Now, what did the British get? They got a very diverse population, but the population remained small and unprosperous. And at first they try to make it pay for them by taxing them heavily and maintaining strict uh, control, but it doesn't really give the profits that it should have. So by 1685, King James II has pretty much lost all interest in the colony. Ready to go to the next slide? Was once new Amsterdam. Why they changed it, I can't say. <laughs> Leesler's Rebellion. Leesler's Rebellion. Okay, Jacob Leesler led a successful rebellion when news of the Glorious Revolution reached New York. And even though he surrendered to the new governor that was appointed by William and Mary, um, he was executed because you're not supposed to touch the king's chosen. Yeah, but you didn't choose him, William and Mary. It was James II. And then said, no, it's not, you don't touch the king's chosen. So he's executed. This divided uh, politics in New York into pro and anti Leesler forces. That lasted for many years. Ready to go to the next slide? Then you have William Penn, who was a Quaker. And Penn, uh, he wanted to uh, establish a refuge for Quakers because they were kind of persecuted in England. And the crown granted him a charter because of his political loyalty, the loans that family has made, as well as his father. His father was an admiral in the Royal Navy. So Penn actually got Pennsylvania. An incredibly resource rich area. So he did get a great deal. Ready for the next slide? Now, William Penn's holy experiment continued. Basically, he wanted to set up a society based on Quaker values, and the Quakers believed in total social equality. In other words, there was no slavery. Uh, there is no difference between Native Americans and us. There is no difference between men and women. Everybody's equal. Also, we're going to be uh, religiously tolerant. You know, where if somebody has a different way of seeing God, hey, that's cool. Either he's going to, you know, everybody has their different walk. They might convert to see it my way. But if they don't, they're still having a relationship, a spiritual relationship. They gave a genuine political participation. And indeed, they used to be one of the largest uh, denominations in the United States. Till they're also pacifist. Well, at least in Pennsylvania. But they were also pacifists. Which meant they didn't think it was right to go to war to solve things. And they believed in giving a fair treatment to the Native Americans. 
buying their land. You don't take it away from them. Also, you don't make ex exorbitant profits on what is sold to them or what you buy from them. So this seems like a really kind of unique society to get started. Ready for the next slide? Now, of course, because the land was so great, you had a lot of non-Quakers moving in. And unlike the Quakers, and you know, the Quakers, they tolerate all these newcomers coming in. And unlike the Quakers who would buy their land from the Native Americans, these newcomers who weren't Quakers, they'd just take it. And when the Native Americans start to rise up, and fight back uh, against the encroaching settlements. Uh, basically, uh, they go to the government and they say, help us out. You need to increase the bounty on Native American scouts. And rather than fight against them, uh, the Quakers instead decide to leave politics. Because once again, they're pacifists and they didn't think that was right. Ready to go to the next slide? Colonies lower south now. Carolinas, Georgia. You ready? The Carolina colony. Well, guys, the Carolina colony, because at first there wasn't a North and South Carolina, both of them together were uh, the Car was the Carolina colony. Eight proprietors had received title to Carolina from the Crown. They wanted to build, you know, just like the Dutch had tried to do along the Hudson River, you know, building kind of like good old feudal towns with the rich land owners and all the serfs. While well, they tried to do that. <clears throat> Nobody really takes them up on that offer. So they have to turn to um, the head right system, uh, Virginia and Maryland. And they produce uh, cash crops for export. But an interesting thing about South Carolina is the cash crop that they grew was rice because it grew incredibly well there and so many people moved there that by 1719 it became a royal colony meanwhile in North Carolina pretty much small farmers settled there their economy centered on tobacco and naval stores in other words you had trees you have the white pines that were uh, great for being ship mass. And you have the tar, like the tar hills. Basically, you have the tar that uh, you could careen the hulls of the vessels with. And you keep all those. But eventually, like South Carolina, North Carolina too becomes a royal colony. Ready for the next slide? Georgia, the last colony. Now, Georgia was the brainchild of James Oglethorpe. Basically, in England, he was looking around, he'd see how many people were imprisoned for debt, and basically, guys, back then, if you were in prison, your family had to pay for you being in prison. They also had to provide you with the food and everything like that. And there's no way these guys could pay off those debts um, when they had to pay 
for being in prison and all that, and they weren't working. So basically, he goes to the king and says, "Hey, give me land that um, I can, you know, put these prisoners on." It's like the American version of Australia that would follow us when they sent other penal colonies there. And the king said, "Sure." And the king gave them land right in Georgia. Now, guys, why do you think that the king would give uh, Oglethorpe this land right here? Well, up here is South Carolina that makes a lot of money growing rice. Right down here is Spanish Florida. So if Spain ever went to war against England, basically they'd come up and they'd attack and kill a lot of people that were nothing more than prisoners before they got to South Carolina. And South Carolina could have time to build up its defenses and all that. So he gives this land to Oglethorpe, and Oglethorpe has a vision. You know, these guys are going to come over here, rebuild, them, rebuild the man, rebuild the land. He wanted a land full of small farmers <coughs> that was each given their allotment of land. They couldn't buy any more land. They couldn't sell their land. That was prohibited, as was alcohol and slave labor. Well, as you can guess, when the colonials first got, oh, they were so grateful to be out of prison. Oh, this is so great. Um, and basically, uh, they let, they do their crops, but then it starts to get old because they look at how much money they're making up in North Carolina. I mean, how much money they're making in South Carolina and they can have slaves and they can have alcohol and they start to become resentful and they challenge Oglethorpe's authority who by 1752 says fine up your nose with a rubber hose and he leaves and when he leaves the king comes in and says don't mind if I do and he makes it a royal colony. And that is the baby steps of our little colonies. Um, now, guys, uh, w this is just us being babies. Our next lecture, we're going to talk about us growing up and kind of becoming, you know, a little stronger, a little smarter, okay? Um, and where we're getting things done, England's still over us, and we're happy to be English. And that's uh, the next part of the development of the American experiment.